What is going on, people? Look at me. I'm in this hotel room. I'm back to a hotel room. Can you believe that? On the road again. Actually, I'm in Chicago checking in on my parents, and I can't wait to talk to all of you and introduce you to another amazing guest. So where are you? We Welcome to Hurdlers of Adversity. I'm your host, John Register. I help business professionals to amputate fear, hurdle adversity, and embrace a new normal mindset to win life's medals. As you know, it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to inspirers and maximizers of pivotal moments. And again, we have another inspirer and maximizer of her pivotal moment. I told you about it a little bit last week, so I hope you checked up on her because she is absolutely dynamite, fantastic. Uh, so I do all of this through keynote speaking, virtual presentations, and we're just talking a little earlier with my guests. You know, a lot of the market is coming back. People need virtual uh, presentations. They still need presentations, whether it's done virtual, remote, or however you want to call it, because we want to make sure that we're investing in the, the people who are working for us and the people who are, are on the front lines, in the trenches, and making sure they have what they need and hearing from them on what it is on how they are shifting. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. So go out there, please get settled in, get your tea, get your coffee, gather your family around. Remember, you got to squelch the noise because this noise today is all about you, impacting you, improving you uh, through inspiration. Inspiration is the catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformational results. And those results, they re-inspire us or they allow someone else who's watching the process to actually catch the vision. If you're trying to get your nightly news and you want to go red versus blue, all that stuff, you can get that later on whatever your favorite channel is. This is all about positivity and pouring into each one of you. That's why I say get the kids around. We are going to go at it today. So thank you to all that are my regulars who are on. So if you are on right now and and you are uh, still watching the stream, I'm not sure who is, is, is on right now, please let us know where you are streaming in from, where you're watching this live from. We want to know uh, because we want to shout you out. I always put my uh, the family, I call you all the fam, onto the stream because we want to see who you are and where you're from. So I uh, hope this is pushing out. I don't see too many of you on right now, and usually you're popping on, so I hope for, this is all going, going out and going well. Um, I have to give everybody a shout out. You know, Lynn Keir is usually on, McKin Mr. McKinney's on all the time. So just thank you for always supporting this show, always supporting this family and every one of you. When you are getting this, whether it's live right now or you are watching this in the replay and you think this is valuable, we want you to shout this out to your tribe, to your audience, because there will be some valuable information that's coming up. Uh, and it's thing that you can put into practice. It's, you can activate on what we're talking about today. It's not just theory. Uh, and this is all practicum. You can actually put it into practice. So thank you so much for being on. All of you who are commenting on my posts, I want to thank you. All of you are sharing the post. Thank you. And all of you have joined our Facebook group. Wow. We just topped over 70 people. It was it was 50 last week. Now we're at 70. We're going to get that group uh, started in a big way. I'm always in there probably about no, at least once a day, but sometimes twice a day, just commenting and posting and everybody else is starting to do the same thing. So the tribe is really growing there. We want to make sure that you're over there and you can join that group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash amputate fear. So we're, that's our amputate fear group. Please join us over there. So for those that don't know me that are new to this broadcast of hurdles of adversity, just let me just give a quick background on, on myself so that you know who's, who's, uh, who's in the room and the room where it happens, the room where it happens, the room where it's a great song. Um, so at 529 in the afternoon on May 17th, 1994, I was one of the fastest 400 meter hurdlers in the world at 530 after running across the hurdle, dislocating my knee and severing an artery behind the kneecap, I would never run another hurdle in my life. So what do you do when life kind of bites you and, and you have a fall and you have a misstep, kind of like COVID season that we're in right now? Well, what happens is you have to, there are two paths you can take. You can either kind of be complacent and do nothing, which I call going backwards because the world continues to pass you by, or you can develop this mindset uh, through resilience, through what you have learned from in your past and push forward 
and elevate. You can use a, a ritual. The ritual develops a rhythm and the rhythm will ele elevate you into the rise that you want. Where do you want to go? So it's still forecasting out and bringing that backwards to you so that you can do something every single day to challenge yourself. I began swimming for physical therapy. That was my ritual. That ritual turned into a rhythm. I started doing it every day and I got pretty good at it, which took me on to the Paralympic Games in 1996, where I swam anchor on the four by 100 meter medley relay team and swam in the, the 50 meter freestyle. Now I was a fish out of water because I was an all American at the University of Arkansas, where I won four all American honors. One was in the long jump. When I saw an athlete with an artificial leg on the long jump runway in, in Atlanta, Georgia, his leg flew off in mid-flight, and he, then he asked the, the question to the official, where would he where would he measure the jump from? I was locked in hook, hook, line, and sinker because I knew in that moment without even having run one step on an artificial leg and not even seeing anybody doing it up until that moment, I knew in that instant I was going to go to four years later to the, the games in Sydney. Lo and behold, I did, won a Paralympic silver medal there, and that's kind of partly of the journey. I'll park the story right there because so many things have happened uh, across that journey. And the guest that I have on today, she was instrumental in me understanding a piece of that journey. So I want to just make sure I always give her props. I always call her my mentor. She hates that when I do that, but she is. Uh, so she has to get used to it and just keep on doing it because I'm going to keep on calling that all the time. Um, so as you're coming on board today, I just want to thank you for you know everything that you're doing. Let me go back. I want to see some of the comments that are happening right now. Oh, we got a lot of folks on. So we have Cheryl Bingham. Hey, John, Cheryl from Colorado Springs. Thank you. Mona Patel is on. Mona is another amputee. Brilliant one. So you got to follow Mona. Mona was uh, one of the CNN heroes, uh, I think a couple, three years ago. So she developed a program, San Antonio, uh, San Antonio Amputee Foundation. I know I screwed that up, Mona, but you know, you can get us all right. You can get me right. Uh, Jalisa Wilson is on. Lynn Keir is absolutely on. Connie Lynn Burklow, uh, she's on. Thank you all for being on. California is in the house. Fayetteville, Arkansas is in the house. And BFF Moan absolutely from San Antonio is on. So thank you all so much for being on. We have a phenomenal guest. I don't want to do any further ado. Let's get ready to jump into it. And of course, shout her out because she is on LinkedIn as well for our guests. And we'll get to it. So put in the chat box. I want to know who was the first downhill skier of color to win an Olympic and Paralympic medal both at the same time? Put that name in the chat box, all right? Uh, bronze, two, bron two bronze and one silver, I believe it was. So my guest today is someone I was introduced to in about 1998. We used the same prosthetic in San Diego, California. I call her my mentor uh, in understanding the value of how to pour into life and lived experience into others to embolden them to live closer to their purpose and their promise. She has been a confidant, an encourager, and a great friend. Um, here is why you need to know this woman. She is a leader amongst leaders. She just figures it out, how to get it done, no matter what the circumstances are. She is the author of How Great Women Lead, How Strong Women Pray, Live Your Joy, and Micro Resilience, and I'm sure a couple of other books that are out there as well. She is a Rhodes Scholar, an economist, a mother, a wife, a solver of problems of world influencers. She was selected by NBC Nightly News as one of the five most inspiring women in America in 1996, a cum laude graduate of Harvard University, Harvard University. I got to do it like this. Harvard University, <laughs> where she then got the road, the road scholarship, and she went to Oxford. I can do that with Oxford to Oxford University. So uh, probably out there with uh, Chad Bozeman, I probably, <laughs> I bet. Um, amazing uh, friend, and I want to introduce you without any further ado. Uh, leadership performance coach, and oh yeah, she is a three-time medalist from Paralympic Games, one gold, three bronze, uh, th two or three bronze. Runs her own foundation and was the first woman. Uh, that's out there, like I said, at Oxford Rhodes Scholar. So let's get her on the line right now. Bonnie St. John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're so great, John. 
No, you are. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be talking with you kind of through the distance of social distancing here. And I'm now in Chicago. So the time frame has changed for me. You know, I'm out with my parents now. So I'm so glad you just made time today and just take some time out of your schedule because I know you are uber busy. You're more busy than I am. Uh, you know, so say hello to everybody. We all, yeah, we all sort of slowed down in the pandemic, but uh, but it's gotten really busy. And our company, Blue Circle Leadership, with my company that I started, uh, we, I told you we went five years ago deep into doing virtual training for leaders. And uh, I started saying, gosh, you know, it was so lucky that we were doing that, you know, and so we, our programs didn't pause. We just kept going and now they're growing because everybody needs more virtual leadership training. And uh, we were also focused on a lot of diversity on leadership training for women and minorities. And so that's become a hot topic too, you know, is we gotta, we gotta Black Lives Matter, you know, we gotta do this. And, uh, and so I was, oh, we're so lucky, we're so lucky. And then finally stopped saying that. I was like, you know what? I gotta stop saying we're lucky. Right. We were smart. <laughs> we were really smart. You know, five years ago, we were saying, this is the future of leadership. It needs to be more virtual and it needs to be more diverse. And now the future has caught up to us. So I'm like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna own it. We were, we were right. at the forefront and now we are uh, in high demand. So you're right. Absolutely. We be busy. You're, we be yeah, busy. Yeah, we be busy. Uh, it's no, it's, it's prepared. And, and it's it's uh, it's the old, my favorite movie is The Incredibles, and, and so Edna Mode. <laughs> well, okay. I, I love this. One. You, I love have you seen that. it? Oh yes, my god, oh, I, I watch I it all Edna. the time. I it's, love Edna. Uh, <laughs> Alan says, you know, Alan, my husband, is from yeah. the Hollywood business, and he says that she's Edna's that little woman who makes the suits, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And she's modeled after a famous uh, fashion. I think one of the ones, the woman who wins all the costume awards. Do you know right. this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this I told you it's my like my favorite movie. And uh she she's walking down the hallway and she says, Luck favors the prepared, darling. Luck favors yes. the prepared. <laughs> so, so you know, you always talk about the new normal, right? And being resilient. And so sometimes you have to create the new normal. So I feel like that's what we did is we created the new normal and then the world caught up to us. Instead of you know being knocked over, you can you can be proactive. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, the whole thing when you wrote the book, you know, on micro resilience and a phenomenal read. Right. And we talk about the little micro steps. We want to really want to dive into that. But you're right. Uh, Edna's right. The the luck does favor the prepared. And so uh, luck is, you know, when preparation and opportunity come together. So you have to have the preparation part for the opportunity when it comes. So therefore, it is not really luck. It's just that you are always constantly in preparation. Um even when it went away for me as a, you know, pretty much 80% of my business is professional speaking, I still had things that were going on that were building towards the online platforms and understanding what my voice was and taking that time to really understand what a person's voice is. So I got a, I got a few questions. I want, you know, just kind of dive in here that I think, you know, if you all have a question, look at that. Lynn Kier says, hi, Bonnie, let's, uh, let's put her up on the, on the screen right now. Boom. Hey, Lynn, what's going on? I got to shout you out. Uh, we had her on the show. Just a phenomenal uh, young lady as well. Just just great. On She's from uh, D-Bold Nick's store. I've got to shout her company out. She's just been a great friend of the show. We have Betty, Sp Betty Speaks. Uh, she's on right now. We have Mona Patel. Got to give her a shout out. Uh, BFF, that's my BFF from San Antonio. We are, we always hop around the, the conference together. I hope she's going to be on the amputee board with me. So I'm just hoping she's going to do that and say yes to that. Say yes, Mona. Um, and then we have Connie that's on, uh, Jaliso Wilson. Uh, she says she's in California. I thought you were in Vegas. I thought you were in Vegas, girl. So let me, let me know where, where you at. Help tell me what's, what's happening. There's, there's a shift that's happening. Let me know. And, um, and then Cheryl Bingham, of course, I worked with her at the United States Olympic committee. So she was doing a lot of the finance pieces and helping you get when you went with us to a couple of, you know, on the, those, those trips overseas when you came back and gave back. Um, so a lot of things have shifted in our world. Uh, especially around COVID, Black Lives Matter. We've got fires in California, kind of where you're hurricanes, from, Sandy. You know, <laughs> hurricanes. It's biblical, man. It's biblical, <laughs> it's <a> biblical proportions. <laughs> what's happening next? What's what's the sixth plague that's coming? Um, give us some tips on how to live in this state a little bit more resilient uh, in terms of this kind of current crazy world with the, with the pandemic, social justice protests, hurricanes. How can we because you're the resilience master, how can we live more resilient? Well, I just want to say before I, before I give uh, some specific tips, just to just to set it up a little bit, is I started doing this research on resilience in 2011, mm. 
and and I've had to be resilient all my life. I I know you you had an accident later uh, as an adult, but I had a birth defect. So all of my life I I got picked on and I was in and out of hospitals. My leg was amputated when I was five and I've had to be resilient all my life, but we really started, so I have a passion about it. And we started researching it to write this book on resilience in 2011. And we worked with thousands of companies and people around the world and, and did a lot of research. And, and it's interesting, I kept meaning to write the book sooner, but the book didn't come out till 2018. So it was kind of version 3.4. <laughs> and that was good, right? Because we didn't have to go back and rewrite the book. So we put a lot of work into researching how can people be more resilient? How can we have really practical tips for being resilient? And we came up with this idea of micro resilience, of really tiny little bits of resilience. So most of, if you Google resilience research, most of it is about getting back to normal. And a lot of it is sort of the big things: is you gotta, you gotta eat right and exercise, and you know, uh, go to therapy and you know, do yoga, you know, and all this stuff that's really right. time consuming. And that's all good, you know, that's all great. But the little things are really important when you're not just trying to get back to normal, but you're you're really competitive. You're at the top of your game. So there was a piece of research that we looked at that really set us on this course of thinking about tiny little bits of resilience. And it was research on tennis players and why certain tennis players always win. So like if you're watching the US Open, there's you know 100 mm -hmm. people playing, but they're always commenting on a few names, right? Because they're the ones that always win. And this researcher, Dr. Jim Lair, was was really interested in why do what puts you in that category, you know? Mm -hmm. And everybody's got skills, you know. Maybe somebody runs faster or serves ninety miles an hour, but he's like, what's the common factor that mm -hmm. puts you in that that group that's always the winningest group? And he he never actually published this research, so I had to go back and interview him. And he said, Bonnie, people thought I was crazy because eventually I started looking at them not playing tennis. He was watching videos and analyzing everything, and he. He started looking at what they did between the points, between the volleys. And he said, then it jumped out at me. Suddenly I saw the top players all had these little behaviors that they were doing between the points to help them regain their focus, their drive and their energy, and go into the next point strong. And mm -hmm. then they started analyzing and you go down the ranks and the top players were doing these little things, but as you went down less and less and less of it. And at the bottom, they weren't doing any of it. And, and it's little things like put your racket in your other hand to rest your racket hand. Don't get distracted by the crowds. They 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 put heart rate monitors on them and found they could get their heart rate back to the optimal range quicker. And so it was just a bunch of little things. And so that's what we did is we went to do to do the research for micro resilience to look at what are the little things we can do between the points during our day that help us be less wiped out. Lots of stuff gets thrown at us, but if we could be less wiped out by it mentally, physically, emotionally. You know, we we can perform better at work, but we can also like be better for our families and our children. You know, is is to go home and and then you know feel more like eating right or exercising. So so it it has so much of a ripple effect in your life. Is doing these little tiny things can make such a big difference. So I want to I want to kind of rift off that because I'm now in my head. I'm thinking about uh, training. So training for the Paralympic Games two two thousand right. And you said, said heart rates. And what I did in my training was I would run four times 100 meters, just really easy. And I would take my pulse after each one of those runs and just kind of get a baseline of every week, what was it? Uh, so I had a kind of a standard. When I got to S Sydney, I did the same thing. And the, the rate of my heart rate had jumped 60 beats a minute just because of the flight and the stress on the, on the body. Uh, and so I knew that I had to keep in that ritual again to get that heart rate back down. I was very you know timely, very specific about that. When you were competing as an athlete and you're going down, you're about to race, can you look back at the times of the micro resilience that you had that gave you the edge when you won your medals in skiing? Well, one big thing was being able to focus. So a ski race can be 30 seconds, you know, maybe a minute, minute and a half at the most. And so you really need to be able to focus. And I was 19 when I went to the Paralympics and teenagers, you know, they're goofing off, talking trash and things like that. And I used to pull myself apart from the crowd of people at the starting gate. So it's different. So when you're running, everybody starts at the same time, right? We don't do that. You sort of mill around and one person goes and then the next person right, goes. Right. 
So there's this sort of hanging around at the starting gate thing that goes on and people let themselves get distracted and talk trash and do all this. And I would pull myself apart and I had a ritual. I love when you said that, a ritual, uh, which is a habit pack, backed by purpose, right? So there's habits and there's rituals. And and so there's more meaning, you know, when you've anyway, so I had a ritual love of that. mental focus and, and a routine that I did to keep myself on track. And that would allow myself to pull out my best performance when I needed it and not to get hung up on these other things. So yeah, it's like the tennis players being able to, to, uh, to pivot and mm -hmm. do that. I think the, the corollary now it's, it's most people aren't skiing or running track or playing tennis. So, you know, for the rest of us in our everyday lives, in our work and our families, you know, how does that apply? And, and what we've learned is that we are so exhausted. And I really feel this in the pandemic now, right? Everybody's working from home. You can't travel. Uh, kids are not necessarily in school. There's a lot of upheaval and it's all right. uncertainty. Every two weeks it changes, you know, it's something <laughs> different, you know, and, and that's exhausting. Our brains were not designed to do that. That's why we don't normally live that way is we rely on a certain amount of certainty and a certain amount of routine to take the load off our brains. So right now there's a heavy load on our brains and I'm feeling it. You feel fuzzy, you feel exhausted. So um, one of the things we talk about is multitasking is really exhausting. And so we have to do it sometimes, but to the extent that you can carve out spaces, we say zones, if you can carve out zones of focus. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, you know, you're on, on Zoom, your spouse is on Zoom, your kids are on Zoom, everybody's Zooming all <laughs> over the house, right? is is you need to to make a deal and maybe you know say to your spouse hey you're going to be watching over the kids for the first four hours i'll watch them over the second four hours you know some kind of deal so that you can get some time to focus you can't constantly be interrupted uh and get your work done uh one one expert said multitasking is fine as long as you don't need quality innovation or or uh <laughs> Accuracy. Uh, so I figure folding laundry in front of the TV is fine for multitasking, you know. But, but there's certain things that you need to do if you need to write a proposal, or uh, maybe you know, even if you're doing staffing and you got to organize everybody, uh, so you, you got to figure you got to have some accuracy. And so carving out some time to do your heaviest mental uh, things and, and not having to multitask while you're doing that saves time, saves errors, and you're going to feel less exhausted at the end of the day. I read a book uh, entitled, I think it's called The Way We're Working Isn't Working. Yes. By Char Have you read that? It's like Charles that. Schwartz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's phenomenal read. And it talks about some, kind of some, some of those zones and, and when they did their studies and when people you know, on the, on the litmus test were working at their optimum, their best, and they didn't realize that they were on their best and in these cycles. Um, and so I took a lot of that and put that into what I do uh, every day now. So I have these, I carve out like 90, 90 minute work zones. And then I take a break. I do something totally different. And I do an another 90 minute hit and I kind of take a lunch and then another 90 minute hit. And I usually can get to four of those in a day before I just kind of freak out. And, not, and, just and like, not everybody can do that, you know, and I think yeah. it's important to say, that not everybody's gonna be able to do that. And the other part is about other people interrupting you, if you have other people on your team or people in your family. And so it becomes important to communicate about communicating. And I think Boy, sometimes great. we all just assume that, you know, people are gonna interrupt us and I'm gonna get texts and I'm gonna get email, you know, and it's gonna be crazy and it's just, that's just the way it is. But, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you communicate about communicating, you can talk mm. to your team and say, you know what? I, I'm going to try to do some really focused work from nine to 11 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, and so try not to interrupt me. And this is what I'm doing. And other people need it too, you know, so you can ask for what you need. They can ask for what they need and you try to support that. Now there's thresholds. If there's an emergency, you know, one woman said, you know, at home, I tell the kids, you know, don't, don't, don't knock on my door to my office unless there's blood, <laughs> you know? but, but there, there has to be, you know, a, a threshold level. And, and you need to know that because you can't really focus on your work unless you know that, that there is no crisis out there. If there was a crisis, they would call me, you know, and, and it, when I was traveling a lot, what I would tell my office was, if you need something you know, within 24 hours, just email. But if you need it right away, text. But don't just text for everything. You know, There's a triage system. So communicating about communicating can help people get what they need, but not constantly be interrupting you. Well, you need to tell that to me because I text you whenever I want to text. <laughs> I need a filter. So I'm like, I need you. I need you. Um, so everybody, we're talking with Bonnie St. John. 
downhill skier, medalists. I want to go. I want to talk a little bit about the the medal because I think this is a, it's a great story you always share with your audiences that leads right, you know, on this on this topic of conversation. But if you are enjoying this conversation, if you're learning something from Bonnie, put her name in the chat. Who needs to know her that you know right now in your world? And if they're on LinkedIn, I want you to forward her name right to them so that you can introduce them to this amazing woman. So just do it, put it out there. What have you been learning? I want to see it in the chat box, comments. I want to put shout you out. What have you been learning? I know uh, about the micro resilience. It's those little moments and I need to put parameters around my time. So that's the one thing I'm taking away right now. So what have you learned? Put that in the chat. I want to shout you out in the comment section right there. We have um, uh, Betty Squ Speaks is out there. Mona, of course. And Lynn Keir, Connie, thank you so much. Uh, Jalisa, appreciate you being on. So keep on, keep those comments coming. And as when I see them coming in, I'm look when I look down here, I'm looking at your comments. So don't I'm, I'm focused here and I'm focused there too as well. So Bonnie talks. Um, Lynn is also in the communication field. So love to communicate about communicating. Yes, a big yes for Bonnie on that one for sure. All right, uh, and, and yeah. Lynn is probably helping people do that. You know what? I I want to tell the story about uh, being at the Olympics, but first. Yeah. I just want to give people another practical idea on this resilience and absolutely the idea this has been really popular is the idea of having a first aid kit for your attitude you know mm. we have first aid kits for a cut or a burn you know we don't know when it's going to happen but we're ready well hey we're going to take hits to our attitude and we don't know when they're going to happen so you can have a first aid kit for your attitude and i actually did a ted talk on this and it's you know 12 minute ted talk so if you want to do this as a team building thing with your, you know, with your team at work or even with your team at home, uh, you can watch the TED Talk and they'll it'll explain the idea of having a first aid kit for your attitude, and then you can make them. You know, you could say, "Hey, let's let's each make our own kit." And it's so funny when I first started talking about this idea, somebody said, "Oh, you should sell first aid kits for your attitude," but I don't think that works because you need to make your own first aid kit. You need to decide what goes into it. And you can maybe do a starter kit for your, your husband or for your team at work, but it's important to challenge them to think about what would turn my attitude around when something bad yeah. happens. Yep. I, I lose a, a contract gets canceled or uh, a customer gets mad at me or, you know, something like that happens. What can I do to turn my attitude around? Just like we we're talking about the tennis players need to be able to turn their attitude and go into the next point strong. We need to be able to, uh, turn our attitude around and, and stay strong. Somebody said, did you have a bad day or did you just have a bad 10 minutes that you let ruin the rest of your day? <laughs> you know, How do we pivot and go back into the next point strong? And what I love about this idea of a first aid kit for your attitude is it's so simple, even kids can get it. So you can do this with your kids, you can do this with your team at work. Um, I did this as an after school event for fourth graders, you know, and I, I bought some fun things. I bought some colorful erasers and uh, some different uh, stickers and things like that. And, and I let them put together their own first aid kit. I, but I'd love to, for kids, I'd love to put in a blank thank you note too. So it's like, if you are feeling down, you can write a thank you note to somebody else and that will help you focus on what's good and how you can be strong. Yeah, so Cheryl, thank you for saying you love that. You can get the whole description of that in uh, the the TED Talk. So if you Google Bonnie and TED Talk, and there's I, I did one for NASA kids, but there's a different one. The one on first aid kit for your attitude is the one you want. Um, so that's a great idea, and you can you do it as a team building event for your your team at work. And if if you lead a team, or even if you're on a team, you if you're listening to John, you're probably the person who's always keeping everybody's energy up. You're probably like John, right? And that's hard to do. So this idea of a first aid kit kind of communicates a message that, hey, you know what? We can all be responsible for our own attitude. Yeah, bad things are going to happen, but you can have a way of pivoting it back. And you can put things in your first aid kit, like inspirational quotes. You can put it in your phone. You know, you can put in a list of inspirational songs. There's some songs you shouldn't listen to when you're down, right? <laughs> um, you can put Absolutely. pictures of family. Yeah. Alan, my husband, who's my co-author on the book, Micro Resilience, he always likes to say too, don't just put all the pictures around your desk and just, because you stop seeing them after a while, is you want to put it in a box or put it in a drawer and take it out when you need it. So you want it to impact you and help you turn, you know, build, be intentional about it. 
I've never thought about putting the pictures in a desk and then pulling them out when I need them because I think I need them all the time. But this, <laughs> but you're saying, need, but you see what I'm saying? I need, I need to put them right there. Okay, inspire me, Alice. The other, the <laughs> other great, the other great thing about having your team have this conversation is not only that you own it, but also that you can help each other. Because sometimes if I'm having a bad day, you know, I'm not thinking, oh, let me go get my first aid kit. You know, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy having a bad day, right? And so when you see somebody else in a funk, you could send if you know, even if you're far away, you can email them a quote or a funny picture and say, you know, hey, I thought you needed some first aid. Stay more blessed than stressed, you know, and you, you can you can give other people a shot in the arm if you sort of all have this idea that, you know, put this in your first aid kit. Here I, you go. I think I think we I think we all have that need right for the first aid kit, but we don't always know where it is. Because when I have something, a cut, I had a cut the other day, I had a cut on my hand. I'm like, where are the Band-Aids? They're not in the same spot. I need to, because I'm bleeding out here. I need, I need something. Um, do you have like the recommendation? I know you said like the drawer. Where, where do we put? But like, that's a great point because you might need to put it in more than one place, right? Yeah. You might need to have it in your car. You know, maybe you have some inspirational quotes in your car. Maybe you have something else at, at where you put your computer. Uh, you know, in the days when we used to travel, <laughs> you could have it in your suitcase. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, you might want to put a few different things in different places, right? Yeah, I I, I think no, I, I know that's right. That we want to have them spread out. I mean, I sometimes I'll put things quotes on my my mirror. So when I'm backing up of the car, oh, that's that's what I I need right there. Uh, and you know, April Holmes, of course, our, our buddy April, she was on last week, and one of the things oh, she was man. talking about was putting. Uh, it on her mirror and she, you know, these are all, if you've been watching these, you you, you can kind of see a theme coming up on everybody. I don't talk to them before, but you hear the themes that keep coming up on how to win and be successful without being intentional yep. about your attitude. Yes. Uh, in, yeah. Intentional about, about being resilient, that it's not, it's not by accident. Yeah. She was talking brushing her teeth. So she, I got two minutes to do nothing. I want to say I'm the best ever. And then she's brushing her teeth. Even when I'm looking at my worst, I'm, I'm the best, right? So I'm the best. I'm the best at brushing my teeth. I'm the best. At the, I'm the best. At, and I want to win the gold medal. I'm, and always that two minutes of just giving her that positive mindset before she goes out during the day. Give Bonnie some love right now if you've been loving this conversation. I know I have been loving this conversation. Um, I, I, I do want to get to that story because I think it's a, a critical piece that when people are in these down moments, they may not have built up that resilience muscle and we're teaching how to do that, but we might not be able to identify where that that muscle is, is coming from and what needs to happen in that. So talk a little bit about the micro resilience, but in that framework of, of the story and while you're doing that, I want to plug my computer in because I think I, it's not plugged in. So I want to make sure I don't lose the whole, the whole no story. Worries. No worries. <laughs> I, so, got, I got the plug right here. <laughs> John's talking about a story that it's probably the story I'm most known for telling too is, is from when I was in the Paralympics in Innsbruck, Austria, and I was the third ranked one legged woman skier in the U S and made the team. And I was so happy, you know, I've been training for years, trying to make the team and I was just happy to make the team. But when you're the third ranked one-legged woman, nobody thinks you're going to beat your teammates, Never mind anybody else in the world. <laughs> and, uh, and there were only three one-legged women on the team. So I just barely made it on the team, you know, but I was happy. I was happy to go. And, uh, my mother came with me to Innsbruck, Austria, which was amazing. She, she had actually, John, I, do you know this? She had never actually seen me in a ski race before that. I did so, not know that. No, I knew it's San Diego. Probably not a lot of not a not lot a lot of races. Yeah, that was one reason. Not a lot of races in San Diego. The other reason is she was a single mom, so she was always working. Mm -hmm. He couldn't just pick up and follow me around the race circuit, you know. So she was always working, and uh, so she didn't get to take time off. So she finally got to go to Innsbruck, Austria. The other thing I would say though, too, is my mom was a school teacher. She was a very practical woman, you know, and she didn't really get it about sports. She'd be right, like, right. "What?" What are those joggers doing? Can't they do something <laughs> more practical with their time? Like they're the bus. down the street. You know, what is that? So we got to Innsbruck, Austria, and in the first run of the slalom race, I came down the hill, and uh, when the times were posted, my time was number one in the world. So it's an upset. You know, nobody's expecting that. But I had trained all summer on a glacier. I had been training with with two legged skiers. You know, I had really pushed myself and raised the bar. So I mean, I'm in first place. My mother went berserk. <laughs> As she should have. 
she was so excited. She's like, joggers, I don't understand, but winning, I like, <laughs> I like you know, it. It's like, it's like, you know. And so she she actually got so excited, my brother rolled her in the snow to cool her off. <laughs> so I kid you not. So uh, anyway, so I have to go back up to the top. It takes two runs combined time to win a, a medal. And, and so I'm waiting my turn for the second run and they radio up that women are crashing. Now, you know, in you were used to track and going hurdles or in, you know, 100 yard dash, it's always the same, you know, it's a track, it's the same. But in the snow, it gets all chewed up. And so the first, the second run is completely different than the first run. It's just never the same twice. And so in the second run, there's this icy area and, and women are crashing. And one woman slipped and went into the stands, was taken to the hospital, you know, I'm at the top going, I just don't want to die. <laughs> I have to say, Ski, I, yes, I know. <laughs> I'm the first African American to win an Olympic or Paralympic medal. You said that at the beginning when you introduced me, but uh, I don't know if you know this too. It's the Black Skiers, the the National Brotherhood of Skiers. Mm -hmm. Like 32 members of them came to cheer me on in Innsbruck, Austria. Oh so God, what I'm saying awesome. is, in the Alps, there were there were 32 black people screaming in the Alps. I mean, it kind of <laughs> it kind of stands out, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah, great. What a, what a support network to do that, right? To, to oh, well, they had raised money. They had passed oh the hat. God. They had helped me get clothes and training expenses. No, that was – my teammates said, Bonnie, you have a really big family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. No, <laughs> yes, I do. Anyway, so I'm going for the second run. Everybody's crashing. I'm thinking I'm going to die. I'm thinking I don't have to go all out. I don't have to ski like crazy. I just have to not fall, and I can win right yeah. Yeah. this gold medal. So I get in the starting gate, they count down five, four, three, two, one. I hit the timing one. I'm hitting the red and the blue gates going down the hill. I got to where I could see the finish line. I think I made it. I'm going to win. That's when I hit the ice. <laughs> I fell on my rear end. You know, I was number one in the world. And then I am sitting on my rear end. I was so disappointed. I just wanted to give up. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to disappoint my, my teammates, my coaches, my mother, you know, and uh, I just wanted to disappear. But you know this, my training took over, you know, my reflex is not what I decided. My body got up, finished the race. And when the dust cleared, I was still in third place. So I got to win the bronze medal, get on the winner's podium, the U.S. flag waving, my mother sobbing in the snow. <laughs> but it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gotten up and finished, even when I didn't think that I was going to win. Right. Now, I was thinking about it afterwards, and the woman who won the gold in that race I had beat her in the first run. So when nothing went wrong, I was the best slalom skier in the world. In the second run, you might think, well, I fell and she didn't know. She fell too. Mm -hmm. So how did she beat me? She couldn't ski faster than me when nothing went wrong. She must have gotten up faster than I did, right? So she won a gold medal at the Paralympics for getting up faster. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I was actually quoted on a Starbucks cup. They were doing a, a promotion where they were printing quotes on the paper cups, 13 million cups. It said, people fall down, winners get up, but sometimes the gold medal winner is just the person who gets up the fastest. So that's tying oh, yeah. into all, everything we're saying about resilience, you know, Absolutely. And, and it's not, if you Google resilience research, it's a lot about people uh, getting back to normal. And, you know, getting building after a hurricane or, or coming back from abuse or, or addiction. And that's important, too. But th the kind of resilience we're talking about, about falling down and getting up in the middle of a slalom race is people at the top of their game. And she won the gold medal because she could get up faster, you know, and she's been training and doing this. And so for all of us, it's not just about being down and out and getting back to normal, but to be able to compete and win and and be at the top of your game in the middle of a pandemic. And you talked about it at the beginning too, is all the speaking got canceled. All my speaking got canceled. All your speaking got, the conferences were gone. Right. And yet you put yourself out there and you let people know. And you said, Hey, I'm a virtual keynote speaker. It's right there on your title. And so a lot of it's coming back and you're making your own opportunities. And so you're, you're being resilient at the top of your game. It's great. Yeah. I think it's also, and I think and thanks for sharing that because I really wanted the audience to hear that story from you. And I'll, I will often reference you saying, so you need to go watch her talk because it's a, it's a great 
lesson people for all fall down. Winners get up, but the up. gold medal winner is just the person who gets up the fastest. Absolutely, and that is. It's so metaphorical for a lot of a lot of things and, and, and like right a lot now. of challenges. Absolutely right now. Yeah. Because and even though, you know, when I use the ampute, I, I do that very intentional. I'm very intentional with using amputation because this moment is what it felt like from a mental standpoint to lose everything that you have been working with and working for. And it's gone. You just don't have it. And so now there are, as you know, there's maybe, you know, maybe you don't, a resili res, um, residual effects, phantom pain. I long for the good old days. I long for what has been lost. I long for that. But that's not coming back. Not at least in that area. Now, we might get back to the semblance of normalcy as it comes back to our routines will be the same again. And we might go back to some of those and those Things that are now new might become the, the, the norm of what we experience every day, but that's not coming back of what's what's been in our, our past. And so a lot of times we'll hold on and we'll focus on that past lived experience. And when I'm kind of do my whole kind of buckets of things, people live in what I call these these stigma, these fears that if I just when things just get back to the way they were. I'll just camp out here until things get back to normal and normal is really gone. Like, like so in resilience, right? You've heard the expression, I'm sure of the rubber band snapping back to its original shape, but a, it do doesn't do that. It, it's always lost some elasticity, right? And B what happens when your rubber band breaks? Mine broke. <laughs> so and, why not, and why not get better? Why go back to your original Absolutely. shape? Actually, you know, it's interesting. So we are, our company, Blue Circle Leadership, does a lot of virtual leadership training for top companies like American Express and Cigna and uh, it, lots of great companies. And and so, and they're, they're long. It's a virtual eight-month program and we're meeting once a month and doing lots of exercises and things. And Gilead. And, and Gilead. <laughs> <laughs> I know that because I just spoke for them. They said, we had this amazing woman that came on and said, body up. Oh, anyway, I digress. Anyway, so we work with lots of great companies and we do these virtual leadership training programs. But but what's interesting is there's a, you know, we're it, we're saying, oh, should you be in this program right now? Everybody's so busy and everybody's pivoting, you know, and, and you know, maybe you should just do the leadership program next year. And absolutely not, because there's a temptation to say, let me just put my head down and like let the wind blow over. And, you know, once all this blows over, then we get back to normal. Then I can do what I need to do. Mm. And what we say to people is absolutely not. You're in a leadership program because mm -hmm. you need to be looking at opportunities right now is your company needs leadership right now. And there's going to be, you can put up your hand and, and ask for an opportunity. You can look at what's going to be, you know, you might've had one set of goals before all of this change started, but you need to reevaluate your goals. You need to look for opportunities. You need to be a leader in the company now, mm -hmm. not wait mm -hmm. for things to, to come back, seize opportunities, create yeah. opportunities. And, um, there's such a temptation, like you said, to just sort of hunker down and wait for change to stop. And then, you know, and you once said your new normal implies that you're going to get to a new change is going to stop. We're going to get to a new normal and then we can stop there. You know, <laughs> and you, said, you realize new normal is not a destination. It's a place you live. You're in a constant state of new normal. And we oh, all you've been reading my stuff. That's good. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a John. Ritchie. It's a plateau to grow. I'm a Bonnie St. John fan. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, but you're so right, right? So what are we missing? What do we often miss? And before we answer that question, once again, I want to know we're talking with Bonnie. Whatever that you've been hearing right now, uh, I want you to pl place in that chat box, right? Uh, first aid kit for your attitude. First aid kit for your attitude. Put that in the chat box, and then whoever needs to hear that in your down chain, in your tribe, shoot that out to them. Make sure that you are, are we're focusing on Bonnie today because this is some gold, y'all. Okay, so what are we missing? And, and Go sorry, you're going to share it with their friends. I, I was going to say, get the link to the TED Talk because that's just a super easy way to share it. Is uh, and then you know it's all explained and and they get the motivation and then they can pass it on too. So I would recommend doing that. And I feel yep. so, I feel so bad because I'm supposed to be your mentor. And if I was really a good mentor, I would have had a <laughs> copy of my book, Micro Resilience, that I'd be holding oh. up because that's how you're supposed to do this. And I didn't do it. So well, I, 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 I hope that if they want more resilience, that they can get the book too. But I'm not yeah, holding well, it up. I should have been holding it up. But I but usually what I do is I would have done it for you but I can't because I'm on one monitor today 
and because I'm in this hotel in a, room. And can we just say you are being a great son? You're in a hotel room because you're you've gone to help your aging parents, and that is such an important thing to do right now. And a lot of people are doing this too. And so it's uh, you are a good man, and I know well, this. That we'll have to see. <laughs> I'm getting fussed out a lot right now. Well, yeah, but it, it's it's the aging parents will do that to you. They will do that they to you. you it's, 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 but it, but you it, it is a blessing. I, say, I, I have lost my parents. My husband has lost his parents yeah. in the last, uh, you know, about two years ago was his mother, and about five years ago was his father, and in their nineties. Amen yeah. to that. But um, you know, it's it's. They get real cranky towards the end, but <laughs> you still miss them. You're, right. you know, you're lucky sure. to still have them. So. I, 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 I am. I so, so much am. So thank you for saying that. I really do appreciate it. Um, so put that in the chat box and micro resilience, Google it. The book is phenomenal. Uh, you can't book, get a signed yeah, copy. I just, shared, I just shared a few little hacks that people can do, yeah. but the book has like 20 different hacks uh, that you can use and, and uh, it's great. Yeah, it, it's just super easy little things that make a big difference. It's it's a, it's a phenomenal read, and and so put that in. Yeah, I would have I would have put it up on my other screen, and you would we would be able to see it and put it, pull it into the, the thing. But I can't do it. So sorry. We're off um, our game today. We're off our game. <laughs> off the game. So uh, what I where I want to go, it's kind of just to begin to kind of wrapping us here is, you know, what is it that really gives you hope? There are a lot of folks that are. You know, they, they they might they they see the end result, and the end result might be so far from them saying, "I could never reach that high height." What continues to give you hope, and how can we impart that to others? Well, I'm not sure if you're asking about like what gives me hope when I'm trying to get to the Olympics or trying to do something, or what gives me hope right now in this crazy right world. now in this I moment. Kind of, well, you know, I kind of want to answer both though because okay, yeah. I think it's really important when you have a big goal that feels overwhelming, like you're trying to start a business or you're trying to make it to the Olympics on one leg when you have no money. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> um, and you know, it's it's a big it's a big big thing. It's really too big. Um, sometimes just taking each step and being a part of it. So like I, there was one point when I uh, moved to Colorado and I got a job in a diner and that was how I was, you know, somebody gave me a free place to live and I got a job in a diner and I was just trying to train and put it together. And I had to walk a mile to get to the diner to start the 6 a.m. breakfast shift and work all the way through lunch. So I would stand for eight hours and you know, slinging hash browns and omelets at construction workers and truckers, and then walk that mile home. After like two days, my leg was so sore. It was like a red piece of meat in you know my stump inside my artificial oh. leg. And uh, it was so hard, but I kept I kept doing it, you know. And then the woman who owned the diner said, you know, I see you kind of limping. Maybe I can pick you up on the way to work. But um, but but just to keep trying. And so sorry, I'm I'm saying, you know, when you have a really big goal that's really hard, mm. it was that feeling that I wasn't just working in a diner, you know, slinging hash browns. I was on my way to the Olympics. And so even if I never made it, I got to spend a part of my life being on the way to the Olympics. When I was trying to write my first book, you know, that's a huge thing and that feels really hard. But I would spend Saturday mornings in a coffee shop writing and I was a writer. Actually, right now, I'll tell you a secret. I just started painting again. I haven't painted since I was in college. And, uh, you know, I needed something to keep me sane in quarantine and, I'm, you know, I'm going nuts. And so I, I took a little loft area in, in uh, my house and I've got a, a, an easel and I got my paints and I got some old shirts to wear. And when I look at that, it just, you know, I'm a painter. Am I a famous painter? No. Am I a good painter? No, <laughs> but I'm a painter, you know. And so whatever your goal is, when you do a little bit of it every day or every week, you can get that zets of strength of saying it's a part of me and and I can get excited about that. And I guess when we think about, you know, the future and can we be excited about the future? I do think there are some good things that are going to come out of this. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that we are all learning to work more virtually, mm -hmm. that's we're not going to lose that. You know, so right. many more companies are doing virtual that didn't used to do virtual before. People are are freer about where they can live. They're not locked into the same things. Uh, you know, kids are getting more flexible schooling. Um, so yeah, it's really tough. And I, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't, you know, a lot of people have died, a lot of people have yeah. suffered. And so I'm not saying this is good, but I'm saying some good can come out of it. We can try to uh, make it good. What's the Bible verse, John, about um, all good comes to those who it's, uh, which is this, um, all, all good comes to those who love God and are served to his purpose. Call the call the corn to his purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, I used to think, well, all, everything turns out good, but that's not true. We have to believe it and we have to make it turn out good. So for all the bad that has happened in this pandemic and all the people that have died, it's like, we have a responsibility to make something good out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's important. So I think to the extent that it turns out good, it will be because we all committed to making it good. So let's commit to that. Absolutely. Um, wow. You're getting some great comments here. <laughs> Lots of love coming up. One person saying absolutely right there. Uh, not sure that another LinkedIn user that's on, but but uh, I, I agree. I agree, LinkedIn user. And um, and then this person says, what an inspiring guest today. Uh, I thank love no, they'll go back to normal, get better. Yes, absolutely, yes. Cheryl. Yeah, thank you. I used to say that too. It was like a, you look at a sponge, you squeeze a sponge, you let it go, it goes back to its original shape. We know we have to get better. Don't go back to yeah. the original shape. We've been squeezed by this pandemic. Let's get better. Yeah, it's always about getting better. Um, so I want to uh, give you opportunity to to know how people can find you. Uh, so what's the best way to get a hold of Bonnie St. John? You can go to bonniestjohn.com. Uh, my company is bluecircleleadership.com, uh, but I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm on Twitter. All those things too. So any of any of those will work. So I want to thank you for being on today. What uh, if if there's, what what if I if I missed anything? Is there something that you want to get out? Well, actually, you know what I want to say is yeah. um, we the idea of a first aid kit for your attitude and a team building event around that. If you go to bluecircleleadership.com and you go to micro resilience, mm -hmm. you can download uh, the kit and tips for doing a team building event. So uh, awesome. that's a nice gift to give to people too. Awesome. So Kevin McAllister, thank you for saying that. Thank you for all of this. We thank you, Kevin, for being on. I, I appreciate that, my friend. Uh, I, I love, you know, just everything that you have given to us. Stacy said, remember that, that, that one comment you were talking about? I have a big family. She said, yes, you do. You got a big family. So Aww, thank all of you, you are you're, a family. You're my family now, too. All right. Thank <laughs> Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to leave it there. Stay on. I'm going to close out the show. And uh, But I really appreciate you taking just a few minutes out of your day. Oh, to share with this you know, audience you you restore my soul john i oh you know i God, know you bro. say i'm your mentor <laughs> but but it's definitely been a mutual support society and i get so much positive energy for you so thank you for being uh such a light in the world and letting me share in that too i, um, I just i love working with you i'm not gonna cry i'm gonna get out of here before you start doing that get out of here see ya <laughs> Hey, everybody, that was Bonnie St. John. What an amazing gift, right? So she's the one that really, when I first called, uh, talking about what's this speaking thing all about? You get paid to speak? She said, absolutely. Let me give everything I got. <laughs> and so it's been going on. Uh, and, and what an amazing gift, gift she is. Hey, remember that um, we have a lot of things that are happening right now. We have a, a championship su champion summit coming up. Uh, I'll I'll put some more in the the, the box, the, the LinkedIn box, and that because I don't have all the information here with me. But you know, I want to know what gives you hope. What what are you doing right now? As Bonnie was talking about in micro resilience, what are you doing right now to give yourself hope? Give other people who are watching you that watch the process. Remember, we talk about inspiration. That you are that inspiration. Um, who is watching you and how are you giving them hope in their life as they watch you? So once again, we want to thank you for everything that's been going on uh, in this show, uh, example with strong woman lead first African American downhill skier medalist, uh, Bonnie St. John was just really just poured into each one of us. Uh, so I know that you're meeting professionals out there. Some of you, some of you are having meetings. Some of you trying to get your teams together, make sure that you're looking at, at Bonnie's site. I'm going to do what's called a speaker showcase. And that's just, I'm going to just host on zoom. I'll put the link out there. If you're interested in that, just to see kind of the, 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 the framework of how we actually have these conversations and how impactful they are for an organization. I'm going to do that on the 29th. So be watching out for that. If you want to DM me directly, I will give you more information. So I'm not going to do a commercial. I just want to just make sure that you know, it is out there for you. Um, and if you know any meeting professionals, just make sure that they have that information as well. So remember that uh, you are the inspiration. 
inspiration in turn, in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformation results. And those results re-inspire us or allow other people who are watching the process to actually catch the vision. So as you are out there, know that somebody is following after you. Once you have achieved that you whatever the medals might be in your life, remember to go back and help somebody else achieve theirs as well. So when we're liberated, our liberations to help other people aspire towards their goals, their dreams, their aspirations. So now I charge you, as always, with every one of these chats we have, to go forth, inspire your world. Why? Because go, that's your command. Forth, that's your direction. Inspire is your vocation. Um, your, it's personal to you. It's your DNA. Only you can do it. And world, it's your sphere of influence. So go forth, inspire your world. We'll see you back here next week at 3 12 in the afternoon, mountain time, 5 12 if you're on the East Coast, like Bonnie is. And we will have a great chat with another guest. Our guest is going to be Carmen Pino of Out of Compo, uh, the steel company, and how he's made his shift. So make sure you're tuning in for that one as well. God bless everybody. See you later. Bye bye.